Let me invite you to open your Bibles to Romans chapter 5, please. We're finishing up our series on crazy love. Next week we start a series on relationships. We'll talk about singles and marrieds and we got panels and we got all kinds of stuff. And um, so we got a lot of good stuff planned for you. We got Easter coming up. Well, we got, a, we got something planned for Easter. We're going to do, do a great thing for Easter. We're going to, all the kids that are here for Easter, we're going to have a big Easter egg hunt for them after the service, directly right after the service. And we're going to have a couple bikes to give away and different things. And so we're, we're going to pack. This place is going to be jam-packed. We might have some overflow and different things too. So invite your friends to Easter and they will hear a message and good music and a message that, will, that won't condemn them but will uplift them and help them see who God really is. Amen? Amen. Romans chapter 5, we're doing a thing called Crazy Love. And the first week we brought the pizza gal in, and uh, Mark and Heather were ordering pizza the other night, and the pizza delivery lady showed up at their house, <laughs> and uh, she, was, she was kind of blown away by our church and did different, yeah, did Mark, did Mark and Heather, did you guys outdo the tip that they did here? <laughs> you didn't, Mark? You, cheap, you're cheap, dude. <laughs> She was blown away. She came forward, and we gave her over a $1,128 tip and uh, with all of your giving. It was amazing, and we're just trying to show that God just won't want to pick somebody out randomly and just show God's love in a practical way. Last week, we paid somebody's rent for a month, and, and uh, I talked about a very tough message on me last week because I talked about developing a generous eye, and I talked about all the things that we do, Therese and I do personally, to give. Very hard message for me because we don't talk about and really, be honest with you, that's only about probably 10% of what we do because I don't, there's so, certain things you just can't talk about. There's just certain, certain things that just between us and other people and, and you just can't do it. But we should, we should develop a generous eye, shouldn't we? We should all have a generous eye. But this is God's love towards us in Romans chapter 5, verse 6. He says, for when we were still without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungod, uh, ungodly. For scarcely a, for a righteous man one would die, yet perhaps for a good man someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates. I've never seen that till right now. God demonstrates. How does he do that? His love towards us, and while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath through him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more we haven't received re reconciliation, we've been saved by his life. Proverbs 11.25 says, the generous soul will be made rich. And then Proverbs 22.9 says, he who has a generous eye will be blessed, for he gives his bread to the poor. I, if you didn't hear last week's message, I want you to go on Facebook and you can go on Face Center and go on Facebook and just listen to it, because we talked about all the things that we do a very uncomfortable message for us, but, um, but you know, he says this, he says, he who has a generous eye will be blessed. Well, I'm not, I am not, I consider myself, I mean, I've got a master's degree in theology, I've, got, I've written books, a book, I'm, I, I got books in me, but I've written a book. Um, well, I didn't write it, but, I, but it, anyway, it's out, the book's out. <laughs> anyway, they edited the book off one of my messages. But anyway, I'm an author, let's just put it that way. I speak all over the world, and... Um, you know, I, I, in November, I'll speak to 17,000 people at one time in the Philippines. They're having a big meeting. I'm, I'm the, they're, they've invited me to be the guy, you know, to speak. And there's 17,000 people I'll speak to. But yet there's part of me just so simple. I'm just so simple. I'm just a simple guy. I've got I've to see it. I've got to understand it. I've got to have black and white. I've just got to, things have to be, if they're complicated now, my wife, now she's multitask. You know, she can drive down the road, put her makeup on, you know, uh, shift gears, talk on the phone, um, you know, do her, do, her, uh, do her, get ready for class on the night, write up a check, all at the same time. For me, it's like, uh, what'd you say? You know, just driving down the road. It's just, I'm pretty simple. I'm pretty simple. So I, I break things down in the Bible like this. I, I'm very simple, so I have to break things down to where I can really get it because it's, it's you know, I, I just have to see it. So he said this. He said, the generous eye will be blessed. And so when I look at the word blessed and I look at the word cursed, I break it down into real simple terms so I can understand it. 
A curse is a spiritual force that works against you. A blessing is a spiritual force that works for you. Enough said. The generous eye will have a spiritual force that works for you. And, you know, the Lord said, you can read Deut- Deuteronomy 28. He said, you know, if you'll obey the voice of the Lord, he said, I'll, I'll, you know, you're gonna bl- I'm going to bless your storehouse. I'm going to bl- bless you coming in, bless you going out. But I think as a church, we need to be a generous church. We need to be a generous people. It should be one of our main things is to develop the eye of blessing and just see what, I, I, you know, I was in, I was walking by, and I, and I tell you these because I told you last week some of these, but this just happened to me this week. I was in line at this, we were doing this dinner down in Tulsa with, for all of our, anyway, leadership and stuff, and I'm in the line with a missionary. And I said, man, that's a nice bag you got there. You know, he had a this certain type of bag that I like. And he said, I said, that's a really cool bag you got there. He said, yeah, 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 it's cool. I said, yeah, I've got one, a black one like that. He said, yeah, I've been looking at this other one. I said, yeah? have? I said, what? that's cool. So show it to me. So he gets on Amazon. He's looking. I said, hey, here's my credit card. Just buy that bag for yourself. And so, it was, so we made a purchase right there in, in the food line as we're, as we're doing that. He said, I got a book I want to give you. So he, he sends me a book. I got this book that he sent me. The, and, then, and then I'm walking by this little bookstore that's in the church where I was at. Um, and, and the Lord says, go in there. So I, so I just feel like this impression. I said, go in there. And this bookstore is, of course, full of books, and then there's these Christian rings there. And, there's, and, and he said, I want you to buy somebody something in this bookstore. So I, this kid's up these Christian rings, and he said, he's looking at them, he's trying them on. I said, what do you like there? He said, oh, this one's kind of cool. I said, hang it up here, I'll buy it for you. And, and I say that to you because it's very hard for me to say, but that's what we talked about last week. But if you develop a generous eye, you'll be blessed. So we as a church need to have a generous eye. But it has to go beyond the four walls, beyond Sunday. We have to get beyond Sunday from our church. And that's what our message is about today is we have to get beyond Sunday to be an outreach church, to be the church that God wants us to have. It's got to be in your business. It's got to be in your life. It's got to be at your school. It's got to be wherever you go. We have to carry this message of Jesus to the world, and, and when I was, I told you about the other day when we were at the, James and I were at the uh, Blazer game, and these guys are screaming out how, you know, people are going to, certain people are going to hell, and different things, if they don't make Jesus the Lord of their life. You know, Jesus didn't have that approach towards people. It, it may have been, it may be true, but Jesus didn't have that approach. Let's see the approach that Jesus had in reaching people. In Luke chapter 10, I want you to turn over there, in Luke chapter 10, and verse 25, he says, behold, a certain lawyer. Now, when you, say, when you see in the Bible the word lawyer, you can't think of the lawyer in the sense of we know the lawyer, and ours is very expensive and costs us a lot of money, and we use them quite often because we're doing property deals, and it's like, how much do you charge? I'm getting off this phone. We are not talking about your family right now. <laughs> we are definitely, I don't care how many kids you have, I don't care if you're going to hell, I don't care if you're sick and cancer, I don't care what it is, we are getting off the phone right now. I'm just kidding. But, so this lawyer, the lawyer that we talk about in the Bible was a lawyer of the Bible, he was a lawyer of the law, they knew the, the, the biblical law very well. As behold, a lawyer stood and tested him, saying, teacher, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? Now see, they're kind of trying to get at him. We're in Luke chapter 10, verse 25. It says, then he said to him, what is written in the law? What is your reading of it? So he answered, the lawyer answered and said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, you have rightly answered, do this and you will live. Of course, the guy is going to come back with another thought. He comes back and says, But he, wanting to justify himself, said to him, and who is my neighbor? Well, I think that's a good, don't don't you think that's a, I mean, he was kind of doing it as a snarky kind of attitude, but don't you think that's a good question to ask? See, we look at the word neighbor here as the guy that lives next door, and that could be. But Jesus forever answers the question by the parable we're about ready to read here. He answers the question of who our neighbor is to 
every, every person in the Bible who our neighbor is. So let's read on. It says, who is my neighbor? Then Jesus answered and said, a certain man went down to Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves, who stripped him of his clothing and wounded him and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a priest came down to the road, and when he saw him, he passed by the other side. And likewise, a Levite, when he arrived at the place, came and looked and passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was. When he saw him, he had compassion. So he went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring out oil and wine, And he set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn, that's a hotel, and took care of him. And on the next day when he departed, he took out two denarii and gave him to the innkeeper and said to him, take care of him and whatever more you spend when I come again, I will repay you. So which of these uh, three do you think was his neighbor who fell among the thieves? And he said, "You you showed mercy on him. And Jesus said, go and do likewise. So let's get the cast of characters here. The lawyer I just told you about. The priest was the pastor of the day. He would be me. He would be the guy. He would be, uh, the priest would be the guy that would perform the sacerdotal duties of the day. Sacerdotal duties are communion and in the Catholic church it would be all kinds of stuff that you could add to that. But the priest would be the pastor of the day. And this guy walked, you know, went past this need and he walked to the other side. Then there was the Levite. Now the Levite was, there was 12 tribes of Israel and the Levitical tribe was the one tribe that didn't get to inherit land. So there's 12 tribes, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. All 11 tribes got to inherit land in the, in the country of Israel, but the Levitical priesthood or tribe didn't get to inherit land because they received tithes from the people and they became the overall, um, if you will, the keepers of the temple and that whole tribe was the ones who produced the, uh, the priesthood and so on and so forth. So you had the priest who was the leader, but then the Levite would be the person that's been in the church for 32 years at Faith Center Church, been here for 32 years, and they kind of ignored the guy also. So the pastor ignored the guy. You know, because the pastor's like, oh, gosh, I'm so tired of helping people. I'm just not going to deal with this thing. The church member didn't help him. The Levi didn't help him because it's like, you know, I teach a Sunday school class anyway, and I'm in the parking, and I do this, and I just don't have time for this today. Right? So then um, we get the, the Samaritan person who was... Total, when Jesus talked to these guys about the Samaritan, this blew their minds. Because the lawyer was the Jewish head guy. He's like, you know, the guy that challenged him. But the Samaritans was, was the people that nobody wanted. They basically, if you could follow this, they were basically uh, a Gentile would fall in love with a Jewish person and they would marry and have kids. And the Gentiles didn't want them because they were half Jew. And the Jewish people didn't want them because they were half Gentile, so they formed a city called Samaria, which was, so this guy was just not supposed to be the guy that was supposed to do this. He was the guy, he was the, the guy that, you know, drives the pickup truck down the road and, you know, doesn't, ha- maybe he's got a little money, but, you know, he's the guy that, you know, probably a little, few tattoos on him. Uh, might even uh, ride with a motorcycle gang guy or something, or just the guy that wasn't the religious guy that you see today. This was the Samaritan guy. And the Samaritan, not the priest, not the Levi, but the Samaritan reaches out and does something for him. And what he did was amazing because what he did was he basically found and described to us Jesus by this parable, finds and describes to us who our neighbor is. Now, who is our neighbor? Basically, who our neighbor is, is wherever you see a need, that's your neighbor. Wherever you see a need, that was your neighbor. That's the one that you're supposed to do. Remember, in Luke chapter 7, I've read this scripture a lot, but let me, religious, religious people and religious, when we get 
to a place in our lives we know we've gone too far when we get so religious that we forget who our neighbor is. I love this scripture, and I've, I've read this a lot recently, and it's quite lengthy, but I want, you to, I want to turn your Bibles to Luke chapter 7, verse 36 through 50, <clears throat> because it tells the story of what we, the Bible, the narrative here says it was the sin, a sinful woman. We don't know if she's a prostitute. We don't know what we assume she was, but we don't know what she did, but generally speaking, we might have pro- probably been a prostitute or maybe a madam or something. We don't know what she was. It says, one of the Pharisees asked him to eat with him. And he went to the Pharisee's house and sat down to eat. And behold, a woman in the city who was a sinner, when she knew that Jesus was at the table of the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster flask of fragrant oil and stood at his feet behind him weeping and began to wash his feet with her tears and wiped them with the hair of her head. And she kissed his feet and anointed them with fragrant oil. When the Pharisees who had invited him saw this, he spoke to himself, saying, This man, if he were a prophet, would know what manner of woman this is who is touching him, for she is a sinner. Jesus answered and said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. (laughs) I always liked that. I was like, I'll bet you did, Jesus. It was never good when my dad or my mom would show up and say, I have something to say to you. I don't know, but that was never like, hey, I got some good news. It was was never, never good news. So he said, teacher, say it. And there, there was a certain creditor who had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii, the other 50. When they had nothing which was to repay, he freely forgave them both. Tell me, therefore, which of them would you love, would love him more? Simon answered, I suppose the one who forgave more. And he said to him, you have rightly judged. Then he turned to the woman and said to Simon, do you see this woman? I think that's just such an odd, funny statement that Jesus made. She's standing right there, and Jesus looks at her and says, do you see this woman? Because religion doesn't see humanity the way Jesus looks at humanity. And when we get religious to a place where we don't see humanity the same way Jesus looks at humanity, we've gotten off track and too far in our, in our lives. Do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet, but she washed my feet with the tears and wiped them with the hair of her head. You gave me no kiss, but this woman has not ceased to kiss my feet since the time I came in. You did not anoint my head with oil, but this woman has anointed my feet with fragrant oil. Therefore I say unto you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But to whom little is forgiven, the same loves little. Then he said to her, your sins are forgiven. And those who sat at the table began to uh, say amongst themselves, who is this who can forgive sins? Then he said to them, your faith has saved you, go in peace." See, our neighbor was right in front of us. Our, our neighbor was right in front of us. And a lot of times, we don't have to look any further than what is right in front of us. It's kind of funny, because I, 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 I grew up in this whole thing about being led by the Spirit, and I believe in being led by the Spirit. Man, thank God for being led by the Spirit. But, I think sometimes when we say we're being led by the Spirit, we overlook a lot of need that, that Jesus never said, pray about, find out whether you should help that person. There was a need, and he met the need because the need was right in front of him. So I think sometimes we, we discover who our neighbor is just by saying, well, there's a need. So how do I meet that need? If there's, a, if there's any way possible, can I meet that need? Now, I realize we can't meet every need, but I wonder if we should at least try to meet most needs. You know, I, I wonder if we should try. The, the neighbor is just the one that was, you know, was right there, um, right there in front of us was the, the neighbor. The other thing that I want to say about this was it was the, your neighbor when in need, and I think we get this from the narrative here of the, of the story of the parable, is your neighbor will never come when it's convenient to you. See, this is a gospel of inconvenience. This is, this is, a, this is a gospel of inconvenience. And, you know, it's funny because in, in our profession, we walk in and, and I'll walk in the office and Heather will be in there. And I'll say, anything happened today? She said, no, it's pretty quiet. 
And in a business, that's a death knell. At our church, that's a hallelujah day. Because when it's, when it's fast and furious, we either got an event coming up or we've got a need that we're trying to meet. You know, well, yeah, you're, you're, you're the pastor. You should be out meeting the need. Well, I, 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 that's true, and we do that. But the reality is, who is your neighbor? And, and how do we meet that need? You say, well, I don't have the resources to meet needs. Well, you won't get the resources until you at least do what you can. I have some goals for my own personal life. I have some goals in the area of giving and different things. We have, Theresa and I have some goals that that are just astronomical goals that we have that we want to impact the world as far as our giving goes and our church and different things. We want to impact the world. And, and so I, I've got I've to I've get out there. I've got to do things. But the, the, the inconvenient time that, that this happens is just, I mean, just get used to this thing that you will probably be inconvenienced if you're going to meet your neighbor's need. You'll probably be inconvenienced. The other thing is, um, I like this part too, that the last, uh, the, Jesus didn't, or, or in this parable, Jesus, and, and, it was, and really, in all through the writings of, of the gospel, you never, ever find, you'll never find a time where when Jesus ministered to somebody, that he ever asked for their qualifications. He never asked, he, I, I don't know of almost, I don't know of any time really that I, can, that I can pinpoint specifically about, he never asked a heart issue. He never asked, um, well, before I heal you, um, let me take you through a five step to find out whether you're worthy of this. Have you been sinning? Uh, sorry, you're not a candidate for healing. Well, he never asked these questions about, he never qualified things, he never asked the question. And when the Samaritan came by and helped this guy that had fallen was half dead when he came by, he didn't go, look, um, oh, I see you're this or I this. Religion did that. Religion qualified it and says, I don't want to help that person probably because of who they were or what they perceived was. But when Jesus did it, he didn't qualify things. He just met the need, and he didn't ask whether they were worthy of that or not. Now, that can get a little sticky in different things sometimes. And, you know, we have a food bank up north, and it's the biggest food bank in Clark, or not in Clark County, but in Callitz County. I'm sure it would be the biggest one in Clark County, too, but in Callitz County. And, and I know one thing, they don't, when, when they serve people up there, they don't ask them the, the questions that religion would ask the questions about. We just serve them and try to serve our community through doing that. Faith Center, I think, has to rise up to a, to a level of serving in a different way than we ever have before. I think if we're really going to impact people, if we're really going to make a difference, if we're really gonna, going to literally change our, our, our county, our community, then we've got to start finding out who our neighbor is and start meeting that need. I, I just I have this thought. I just want to share with you um, the last thing I want to share with you. I was on Facebook the other day, and, and um, my buddy was, uh, he's a pastor in Puyallup. Don't say that too fast, Puyallup. And he, they posted this little video of him, and, and I want to share this video with you, and then I want to ask you the question off this video. So let's, let's play this video. My dad, he pastored a, a country church for about nine years, and uh, there was a lot of, lot of older people in that church. I, I used to say I grew up around old people all the time. I felt like we lived in the nursing home, and you know, we, we were always seeing somebody, either they were dead or dying or going to die soon, you know. And uh, one of the gentlemen in the church, he wasn't a very vocal man, but he was a prominent businessman in the area and he had he had this um, it was a new Mercedes at that time it was green had that green color and it had the diesel engine in it because it you know you could hear it knock when he started it and, and after church every Sunday he and I we would go sit in the front seat of his car while people were coming out and his wife would be in such a class act she was like Marva and we'd sit in that front seat and watch the people come out and he would talk to me he'd speak to me and 
he'd share his Tic Tacs with me. He was in his late 70s. I think I was seven, eight years old. We weren't related, but that didn't matter. He spoke into my life. He, he added value to me. I mean, mom and dad, they're supposed to love you, right? They're supposed to value you, but who was he? And he died. And it was the first funeral that I'd ever experienced as a young boy of losing somebody so close. He was like losing a grandparent. I remember being at the graveside because I couldn't get out of the car. I hurt so bad. I sat in the back of the car and I remember punching the back of the seat, bawling my eyes out. Why God? Why? Why did he leave? Why did he go home? He meant so much to me. And then God quickened me. And he said this. How many of you in this room will be in your casket? And how many children that you won't even be related to be crying because you're gone? Because you invested in them. pretty good question, isn't it? I know it doesn't seem like much, but I I think about different people. You know, I think about um, Gard and Tom are here this morning, um, Teresa's parents, and Tom is, um, now he'll cry. He always does. but, (laughs) But how long ago did you quit drinking, Pops? How long ago did you quit drinking? 30 years ago? February 3rd, 86. And when I, I remember, I remember, uh, I, I, Garda went to him and, and by the, by the way, these people were married for 27 years and separated for 27 years and they got, re, and did their thing again. So like they always hung out together anyway. So they're, they don't, uh, anyway, but, um, so Garda, my mother-in-law, went to him and said, you know, you're going to lose your family if you don't quit drinking. I remember when we first got married, we go over there and he, he, he drank screwdrivers. You know what a screwdriver is? You're not supposed to know what a screwdriver is. <laughs> but what he did is he just poured, a, I, I watched him sometimes, he would pour like a big thing of vodka and just turn, make, it, make it just a little bit yellow to make it look like it was a screwdriver, you know. And, um, and he, he was a heavy drinker. And one day... He just said, you know, I'm going to lose my family if I don't. And he quit. And so was, whatever he said, the dates were on that. Now, contrast that with my dad, who he, he couldn't give up alcohol. And my dad never watched Joel play a baseball game. This guy was at hundreds of baseball games. Um, this guy was more of a father to me than my dad was. Not because my dad was a bad guy. It's just because he couldn't kick alcohol. And this guy decided to do something about it. And that impacted me. That, that impacts me. That, that makes a difference to me. And, then, and it makes a difference to my son. And, and see, that doesn't seem like much for a family, but uh, or doesn't seem like, well, that's this little thing. No, that's, that's impacting to me. You see what I'm saying? So who, who are you? in your life, who, who's your neighbor that's waiting on you? Mike's in these schools, uh, counselor at Fort Vancouver High School, right, Mike? Beard and all. And uh, no hair, but a lot of it, all of it ended up down here. Gravity sometimes does that to you. It pulls you. But I wonder how many kids you've influenced because you're a counselor, at, you know, teacher and counselor and and some people have showed up here. Matter of fact, somebody showed up at our church the other day and was talking about their, their child. And I said, yeah, I said, well, I got a, we got a friend that goes to, you know, one of our main people here goes to, or, as a counselor there. And they said, well, it wouldn't be so-and-so. I said, yeah. And it was, her child was being counseled by him and different things. And so 
I think that's rubber meets the road type Christianity. I, I think this is, it's really rubber meets the road type Christianity. It's really, it's good Samaritan stuff. It's, it's really down to earth, boots on the ground, generous eye. Who do I need to share my Tic Tacs with? I know it's weird nowadays. You know, if you're out in the parking lot sharing Tic Tacs with a kid, we'll pull you out of there now, you know. <laughs> it's a sad thing that it's come to that, but, but yeah, it's not the same world we live in now, so you've got to pass a background check to, to give your Tic Tacs and, and get the security guards we got out there and <laughs> different things. But who, who is your neighbor? Who's your neighbor? Who, 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 are you, who are you touching? What child are you touching? What, what life are you touching? What, what person are you touching? I don't know if you know that one of my, my favorite employee of all time, um, besides my wife, um, is Adam Klepper. He's my, one of my, is Adam here this morning, Adam Klepper? Adam Clever, he's not here, this morning, but he's, he's got a little case of Down syndrome. And you should watch Adam around here. I mean, he is, I mean, he, I love that kid, but sometimes he'll come out of there and throw down a cuss word like you can't believe. <laughs> but I'll tell you one thing, I will do without a paycheck and every staff member will be laid off before Adam Klepper gets laid off from this church. He, he was sitting around their, the, the dinner table one day with his family and they were asking, what would be your dream job to their kids? This is years ago. What would be your dream job? And he said, I've got my dream job. I, I work for Glenn Johnson. <laughs> How do you replace that? Who, who's your neighbor? We get this hustle bustle of life and we're going through life and we put our nose to the grindstone and we just, we're getting life done and we put our head down and we're missing our neighbor sometimes as we get out there and we, we're missing that mom that needs just prayer that day and we're missing that one student, that one guy, that the guy that just, you know, impacts or, or whoever it might be. But, and I ask you the question, Who's your neighbor? I'd venture to say, when I ask that question, boop, 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 light bulbs, boop, 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 boop. And what that means is, Holy Spirit speaking to you, Holy Spirit speaking to you. And like, who are you involved with in your life? Now, we're doing this thing with um, Daybreak, um, just trying to get something outside of our church. I mean, there's a lot to do inside of our church, but just something outside of our church that, you know, put up some sheetrock or just help some landscaping or, you know, do something for our county. Or I, I think to really be an impact church, it can't just be about us coming here on Sunday morning. It's, it's got to be, it's got to be beyond the walls of, of Sunday morning. And many of you, so many of you do that. And and, uh, I, and I'm so impressed. And there's so many stories that, that probably could be told of, you know, different people that are just making a difference, doing some amazing things. If you're in business, some, some of your clients are your, are your neighbor. Who needs that touch? Who needs you to be lifted up? Who needs that person to, that you need to lift up? Well, I don't know, man. We might run out of money if we give them something. Well, I always say if I'm going to go drown, might as well go down. You know, if you're going to, if I'm going to go down baseball, I'm going to go down swinging. I'm going to, I'm going to go down at least giving it some attempt, a shot, something at it. Who's your neighbor? Maybe we'll just leave on this solemn thought today. Who is your neighbor? 
Who's your neighbor? And I can tell you a story of people that in the churches, in our church, that people take people that, you know, they're maybe not, not as mentally sharp as other people and maybe challenged mentally and people reaching out to them and helping them and going alongside of them and blessing them. And, you know, and I remember the last thing I want to tell you about is I, my pastor. I still haven't been able to do this, my pastor. I've told you the story a few times. My pastor, Earl Matson, he, uh, he would be very cool today because he wore black horn rim glasses. They were not cool when he was wearing them. And he'd wear a tweed suit coat, a little barrel-chested guy, and pastored right across the street at the Square Dance Center there, a little 35-member church. And there was a lady that Dorothy and Earl, uh, my, my pastors, took care of. Her name was Betty Mann. Back in the 50s, Betty had some emotional problems, and back in the 50s, when she was a teenager, I, I suppose she was a teenager or young lady in the, in the 50s, they believed in shock treatments to, to help the mentally ill. So they gave her shock treatments, and I don't think it helped. I think it made it worse. And uh, so Dorothy and Earl, for some reason, I don't know how they connected with, with Betty Mann, but she lived up off of Brant Road of down here in Vancouver. She lived up off of Brant Road. And I've been to her house many times because I would go over there with Dorothy and Earl, and they'd always tell me about, you know, they ran her finances for her and, you know, and, and bought her food and different things. And no relation, just helped her out. And, um, and she would eat, and when she would eat, she, she would never put her, her, her teeth in. And, and I remember eating with her, and it had this, you know, this just thing, and her food's falling out of her mouth, and, and yeah, you know. And it was, remember Therese? Remember that many times? Therese and I have been. And then one day my pastor uh, went over there and, and, and I didn't know he did this on a regular basis, but, what, but Betty was a heavy, heavy lady. And so my pastor would get down there and he would cut her toenails for her. Thank God there's toenail places around now because that's where she'd go if I was her pastor. pedicures and manicures and I'd have her hair done. To, to, I'd do everything just so I don't have to do that. But think about that, that Betty's probably in heaven today because of Dorothy and Earl Matson bringing her to church, running her finances for her, make sure she had food. Dorothy used to get so mad at her and I used to get so mad at Dorothy. My pastor died five years after we started pastoring, and I brought her on staff, and I took care of her till the day she died. I paid her salary till the day she died, and we took care of her. As a church, we took care of her because she was a widow, and I took care of her for 17 years. I took care of her, my pastor's wife after that for 17 years. I took care of her. And I did it not because I felt obligated to them totally. I mean, it was part of that, but I think part of it was because I watched what they did for Betty. And I know, I know that's about the lowest thing, you know, thinking process that we can have. But I'm, I'm going to leave you with this question today. Who is your neighbor? Who's your neighbor? Bye. Have a good Sunday.